Okay, I'll admit it. This is one of my most favorite dive watches in the world. I had to talk about it. I have this feeling that we're going to see it soon, especially judging by just the watches that have been brought out in recent months, recent years, because we're seeing watches like these win at GPHG. I don't mean to brag or anything, but it's, it's pretty cool. This would be a perfect contender. The Seamaster 300, the illustrious dive watch, one of Omega's flagship, one of my favorite watches ever made. You know, as well as I do, that I could talk about this watch for days on end and never tire of it. A year ago, I made a video on this channel about the MOD Seamaster, the famous Seamaster 300 that pushed the big triangle aesthetic that had a T hallmark on its dial that was made for the Royal Navy during the early 1970s. Being some of the earliest examples of a modern military dive watch, this became the chief inspiration for the Rolex Millsub for the likes of the Tudor Snowflake. The Ministry of Defense had a whole range of standards that they wanted fulfilled, and it was from these prototypes that we saw the future development of the 165.024 or the 166.024. Now, why am I telling you all of this? The enthusiast in me says, I believe that we are going to see a near faithful recreation of this watch very soon. 2023 marks the 60th anniversary of the 165.024, a watch that was originally created in 1963. And it needs to be said that if Omega had to do this, it would be the one dive watch to rule them all. It would be one of the greatest divers of all time. As we know, Omega as a brand likes the element of surprise. When they released the Ed White 321 Speedmaster, did we not all go mad? In 2017, when they gave us the 60th anniversary trilogy collection, was that not exceptional? That was one of the showstoppers. How about one of their most recent launches of the third generation Snoopy Speedmaster? This professional case, Seamaster 300, is right up there in the specialist camp. And for someone like me out there who loves the overbuilt nature and the, the attention to detail of these professional dive watches, this is right up there for me. Yes, it needs to be said that the Planet Ocean has been the natural evolution of this model line. We could say that the 024 was the base plate for this model. And so many of the elements are there, you can see it clear as day. But as we know, there is a small department in Omega that loves to share faithful recreations. And a watch like this would be astounding. The simple history of how this watch evolved and became far beefier, far more professional oriented is pretty fascinating. Of course, it began with the CK2913, the straight lug case. But very soon after, in the early 1960s, we would see quite a deviation and a change to its dial layout, even the handset used. Gone was the broad arrow hand in favor of pencil hands, and the reference was simply known as the 165.14. Very easy to recognize that this is a more modern take on a classic. This evolution and this change between the 165.014 and the 165.024 is the inclusion of a liar lug case. The watch went from 39 millimeters in diameter to 42 millimeters. What's fascinating in the late 60s is that they used a Speedmaster case. It's nothing really special. But on top of that, they just gave it more. A larger bezel with increased knurling, fully graduated insert, Bakelite. The early watches still using a Nyad crown system, which was a series of gaskets, it was not a screw down system, which was quite temperamental. At shallow levels, the watch is actually prone to water ingress, but the deeper you go, the more the pressure builds up around the seals, which allows for the watch to be more water resistant. Safe to say this was quite a primitive technology because Rolex actually owned the patent to screw down crowns at the time. And this beefier, more professional oriented Seamaster 300 saw its time in the limelight when it was first asked to be used by the Ministry of Defense. Interestingly enough, some of the earliest batches of these models were issued to the RAF, to the SAS, before eventually being fed to the Royal Navy. And of course, the most famous of these models did away with the 12 numeral at the top, replaced it with a large triangle. These now being known today as MOD Seamaster 300s, highly collectible. Now these are great, great watches. I love them because of the aesthetics. I love the extra presence they have on the wrist. I think unlike so many dive watches today that focus purely on the fashion, this one was directed at being a functional instrument first. For a larger than average dive watch, it used up that negative space so effectively. And with it, you get many tiny details that you wouldn't see otherwise, like open nines and sixes. A beautiful use of typeface. Some of the earliest inclusions of sword hands on a dive watch. And it needs to be said that these watches were the prototypes. These set the standard that the other brands would follow afterwards. 
So the great intersection is that not only were these the first professional, in quotations, Seamaster 300s, but these were also the first prototypes. So let's say hypothetically that Omega is in the background working on this new watch. Where could we pull our inspirations from? I look to the No Time To Die Seamaster, the latest James Bond titanium model. I look at the Planet Ocean, the Ultra Deep, and the Seamaster 300 that I think would be at the root of the inspiration would be the original 165.024, with pencil hands with a 12 o'clock marker at the top of the dial. The sort of transitional reference between the old and the new. There's so much potential in this watch, in this design, and what they could do. The flat link bracelet brought back again, a liar lug case, chunky bezel, titanium case and bracelet. I mean, it's, it's the perfect storm, it's the perfect formula. Especially now, because we're seeing watches like these win at GPHG. I don't mean to brag or anything, but it's pretty cool. This watch would be a perfect contender. And maybe, yes, I'm one of only a few enthusiasts who really wants to see this model remade. But I think what defines it is it's so unique. It belongs to Omega. Its design, its identity is all original. And a watch like this would bring so much attention to the Seamaster 300 again. The question needs to be asked, does Omega need to bring out a watch like this? Of course they don't. We look to the Seamaster Professional line, that collection is so strong. We look to the Planet Ocean, that's doing extremely well. The Seamaster 300 collection, the Heritage model, just as great. Now, maybe I'm only one of a few people in the world that wants to see this watch recreated, preferably in titanium, because it is such an original design that belongs to the brand. It earmarks a point in their history that is very important. It's a design that we haven't seen anywhere else from other makers. And it highlights this transitional period where the early dive watch was seen as something more fashionable. There was no clear idea about its purpose and its future intent. But at this stage in its life, by the late 60s, the early 70s, it was being used as a tool in environments that years before weren't seen possible to explore. I think the best way I could describe the 165 or the 166.024 is it's a cornerstone watch that caps off the development of Omega's dive watch history. That is the reason why it is so significant. A celebration of an important anniversary and a moment in their dive watch history that should be commemorated. So really the sky is the limit with this collection. Whether the brand decides to go down a faithful route of bringing back an original or being a bit more creative, cross-pollinating and using elements from the MOD dive watch in an ultimate configuration. Mark my words that whether it is a month from now or 10 years from now, when this watch finally arrives, it is going to be beautiful. And odds are I will be first in line to talk about it.